let's see what we can derive from one of my favorite parts in the Judeo-Christian Bible, the fruit of the spirit. Perhaps by looking at it through the lens of cognitive psychology, CBT, and neuroscience. First of all, one caveat. I'll be referring to the following religions as belief systems, because that is what they are. It's unfortunate that this term has acquired such stigma, because we are always engaging in belief systems whether we know it or not. Whether we embrace and practice them consciously makes all the difference. Avoiding belief systems and daily practices can lead us to imbalance. Anyways, let's begin. The fruit of the spirit is basically a list of virtues, attributes that we want to instill in ourselves and seek to nurture in others. The first fruit of the spirit is love. Of course it is. This is the primary, primary thing here. Defining it, however, is a little bit tricky. Obviously, in different languages, there are different types of love. We have philosophia, which is love of knowledge, philosophy. We have agape love, the love of God, or a feeling a God-like love, a love of Christ, things like that. And we have all the other versions of love in other languages that describe like brotherly love, or friendly love, or romantic love, or anything else. I've always liked the idea that love is the universal language, but this gets a little complicated when we bring in evolution and microbiology. I now like to think of it as a universal preliminary requirement for every interaction. It should precede every consideration of the other person's point. We of course should not first retort with anger, nor should we retort with logical criticism but we should retort from a place of love and understanding first. Our criticism, however useful, will always benefit from coming from a place of love and understanding, or seeking to understand and relate to each other. This is where I remember Stephen Covey's quote. He says, seek first to understand, then to be understood. Seeking to understand gives way to feelings of relation, and this equates to relevance realization in most instances, and I would say this relates heavily to love. Relevance, relation, and love are in a mutually enhancing exchange that when examined, enhances each. Love is something that we want to establish for all things, all, all people, beliefs, and all activities. Now we can only love people so much if the belief system that we use dictates that all the other belief systems are wrong, or are considered a sin, which is an act that cannot be loved, according to the Judeo-Christian Bible at least. It makes it harder to show and feel love and respect for the practices of other belief systems. What we want is to establish the most love for the most living and non-living things possible. As my friend Shane puts it, love is the feeling of being understood and understanding others. It is a connection. It is when the perceiving universe makes a connection with itself via another perceiving universe. This is when we feel love and participate in the act of love, coming primarily from a place of relation, seeking to relate to each other, we're looking for common ground. This is why we have the term common ground. And again, there are millions and millions of ways that we are more similar than we are different. And all you have to do is crack open an evolution book or biology book to be able to understand what I'm talking about. Joy. Now I should say the way that I interpret the word spirit in these parables is as the thing that we should be producing these attributes through. And then I would say that the process of producing these attributes is something that would be benefited by self-awareness exercises, to which I doubt many a psychologist would disagree. So let's take a convenience store as an example. So from an aware point of view, my salience landscape having been expanded such that I am consistently seeking ways to relate to all the customers in the store. I can better spread joy to them. So I'll recognize somebody in the store wearing a panther's hat and I'll say, hey, relevant sports ball troop. <laughs> or I'll notice a cashier looking really tired and I'll offer them some caffeine gum or encouragement or a joke or a compliment on their work ethic to make them feel better. Being a cashier at a convenience store is not an easy job, I should say. It's often quite berating. Now what does modern day psychotherapy and neuroscience have to say about joy? Well, we know that the kinds of overstimulating joy available today are far different than those that were available when the Bible was written. And we often have to turn to these professionals for methods of dealing with addiction. This includes gambling, food, sex, social media, et merita. Well, obviously the brain relies heavily on dopamine, the neurochemical of pursuit, which produces the sensation of reward when we actually get what we want. And blah blah blah, today's society commodifies dopamine such that we're always in reward mode, blah 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 blah. Let me be quite specific. The western consumerist form of modern day late stage capitalism is a horrible beast. Commercialism and consumerism began innocently after Luther and the Protestant Revolution, and has evolved into a seething miasma that permeates and stains the natural beauty of culture. Modern consumerist capitalism hangs as a carrot on a stick for many to pursue fulfilling someone else's goals in life, and for the rest of us it manifests in our entertainment. Consumerist advertisement interrupts us from our addictions to the consumerist material instant gratification counterculture that plays so heavily on our dopamine. We are in a world of constant reward. And what this equates to is us not being able to be here now, to be present, open-minded, and mindful. We want to be balanced and bounded in our own joy, and boundless in the way that we share it with others. Because it's naturally harder to actually garner genuine joy within ourselves than it is to present joy to others. Whether it's putting on a fake smile, or it's genuinely trying to reach out and, and uh, come from a place of a positive attitude, it's always easier to do that. The example that we always go to in psychology is 
the fact that we can be super pissed off and just ranting and raving and then somebody calls us for a business call or like an opportunity that we have to sell something or something and we'll suddenly change our tone entirely we'll be like oh how's it going oh are you doing well oh things are just fine over here like it's we can do that we have the capacity to instantly change the way that we're speaking when something comes out externally like that when we have an external affecting factor that affects our it affects us, it affects our decision making. It is harder to garner this internal joy with our thoughts alone. We have to act. We must go out and experience life in order to inspire the joyful thoughts to develop within ourselves. Spreading joy is critical in this world, and it comes in many forms, so many of which are culturally influenced. The celebrations in so many forms and iterations span the world today. Music and dance and art, sailing and fishing and hiking, Recording and sharing these activities brings joy to others as well, as well as preserving the memories, which contributes to our psychological stability. Establishing joy in ourselves and others is of course aided by establishing love in ourselves and others as well. That's why love is the primary number one attribute. Now for the Rhineland mystics, love was very much concerned with the concept of the will. Now for them it was not so much that the will gave way to love, but that the negation of the will brought love, a form of sacrificial love. They thought that to love was to sacrifice yourself, to put others first before yourself. And when the will is based around the self, that is egocentric and the opposite of agape love. And this is where I would break from the hierarchical structures of most religions and say that we do want to establish a form of love for all forms of life, and this doesn't have to get less and less diminished based on the perceived complexity of the organisms or non-organic life that we're talking about here. I hate saying this because it sounds like I'm just talking trash about the Bible, but these are one of the things that we need to address that I think is, is holding us back a bit. It's not just the Bible. There are many religions that talk about this idea of the hierarchy of the order of things that are important or <laughs> have consciousness or can get into heaven and things like that. So there was like the angels and then actually the humans were a little bit above the angels if I'm not mistaken. And then there was the animals and then there was like plants and the fungi and then the insects below that and all that. And, and the idea of considering the quantum realm or considering uh, matter and the amalgamations of matter and how that fluctuates over time and how that can be considered as conscious in one way or another. That, of course, was never considered until recently. This is one of the things that brings me personally much more joy and fulfillment in my life, is being able to search and find sources of love for everything. Uh, understanding f fluid dynamics of all things really uh, set this in place for me. The idea that everything is in a fluid state, and from that I relate to everything. Um, you look at jagged rocks sticking out from the Grand Canyon, and you can see how they've sagged over time based on the line, the line changes and the uh, and the striations and the development of the rock faces. Everything is in motion. Everything is in fluctuation. This is what Heraclitus was talking about. Everything is is in flux, and we can either vibe with that and find ways to respect and embody that, or we can hide from it and continue to think of ourselves as high and mighty over all the other creatures, and the creeping things, all those creepy crawlies that creep beneath our toes. As we do not know the consciousness of anything else but ourselves, we cannot speak for its ability to take joy from us. So we can't not say that the rock is not happy from the fact that we washed it off, cleaned it, and put it with a bunch of other rocks that look pretty, or the plant is not happy for being surrounded by its other plants that it can share energy with, share nutrients with through the root systems and fungus systems and all that. So from this perspective, we should spread joy to as many things as we want. Plants, animals, and fungi, whatever. Now, one more caveat here. Living from a place of the spiritual experience or a spirited life, one of the consequences of that can be spreading joy or it can be producing joy. But we should remember that it is not that we're seeking joy. We're seeking to produce these attributes. And, and we want to see them in others by sharing them and giving them this example and instilling that, being the change that we want to see. We should be pursuing this, like this is not something that, it's not a state that we want to be in all the time because that's not how it works, like <laughs> joy is largely if not completely dictated by chemical exchanges and we only have so much dopamine. We only have so many cycles of dopaminergic upregulation that we can produce. So from a very neurochemical and physiological level, we can only be so happy at <laughs> for so long. And so knowing that, like, we shouldn't be surprised when we get depressed for a little bit, or when we are in a low state, or when we're just in a, in a medium state. We should remember not to let society influence us when we're in that medium state, because there are a lot of ways that we can be influenced by society and the world to think negatively about things, or consider the ways that things are going negatively, or that we're suffering when we are actually just in a very baseline, middle, middle state. And we have to remember that we are bombarded by sources of joy in the more capitalist developed nations like the US. And we're encouraged to think that if we aren't happy all the time, then there's something wrong with us. Social media exacerbates false joy as well. 
people only show the good parts of their lives. And sometimes to get us out of that that way of thinking, it is good to seek joy from others. So yeah, this is, this is a very primary attribute that we should be seeking to produce and to see in others. Virtue number three, peace. Serenity, calmness, equanimity. Of course, having established a good sense of love and joy, we'll be at peace more naturally instead of being stressed. But how do we instill these qualities? Like most virtues, it's more complicated than we'd like it to be. There are many methods stretching back 3,000 years. People have been striving for internal and external peace for millennia. Well, what would a therapist or neuroscientist say? The majority of the time, they would refer you to a set of practices, disciplines that require time and effort, and are often based on ancient meditation practices. As Andrew Huberman puts it, he says something like, these are the practices that the science community has thought to be woo-woo for decades, that are now likely to one day become mainstream, as more and more neuroscientific evidence leads credence to the practices." End quote. There are no better methods for establishing inner peace than through meditation, and one of the best methods is vipassana, or mindfulness meditation. Now this is a large part of what CBT is focused around establishing, and the therapies offer various frameworks for bringing about that peace, which we'll discuss in future episodes. If one does not favor the idea of meditation, or has tried it but has gotten no benefit from it, it is likely because they've already established a balanced set of healthy habits and routines. The mind-body connection craves balance and regulation. Our cells look forward to a proper sleep schedule, an eating schedule, and exercise regimen. And I, I use this term look forward quite literally. There, there are mechanisms in our very DNA that depend on the clocks that are regulated by the suprachiasmatic nucleus and other systems in the brain that are just based on really deeply ingrained patterns that our species has had ingrained for a long, long time that are now being highly compromised by the brand new crazy world that we're in. We need routine. Radical shifts and surprises to our life can throw us into a spiral or make us feel frantic and unsettled. And this can lead to depression and anxiety. Now we've discussed inner peace, how about outer peace? How do we establish peace in the world? If you're not in a proper place in life or lack the talents to pursue a political position to change things directly, then change things in the community. You can start a community garden or become a teacher. Remember, the education system and the homestead are the main places where our disorders and maladaptations are formed, and you can be a positive influencer in this regard. You can be an influencer, online or in reality. Just lead by example. Take yourself and your life seriously. Number four, patience. Peace and patience perpetuate and reinforce each other, but they're not synonymous. Patience is an exercise, peace is a state of being. We have a large amount of data on the neurochemical trade-offs going on. When we are put into a state of anger or are enraged, adrenaline is produced. Parts of the default mode network come into play as parts of the dor dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that says no to things, shuts off. We are first and foremost a reactionary species. If we weren't, we wouldn't have survived in the times when we were growing up in the wild. The necessary traits of our ancient ancestors remain, and they carry over into our modern day world in some very interesting and sometimes unfortunate ways. We must address our impulses to preserve ourselves and those we most closely relate to, and exert prefrontal cortex top-down effort to see things from a wider perspective. Doing so allows us to have patience in the face of all propositions, and equanimity in the face of mistreatment or offense. Patience is also involved in our personal lives. We have to wait for things that we want. Dopamine causes us to want things. This we must continuously exercise top-down effort to deny. This, like all neurological processes, has its limits, so we shouldn't beat ourselves up when we occasionally give in to our impulses. We are human. That said, meditation and CBT practices like thought monitoring and repeating of mantras has proven to help in such regards. In the more capitalist countries, the culture of gotta have it now is really enforced by credit card systems and loans and other lending systems that are difficult and complicated to keep up with. We make a business out of people's naturally overactive desires, due to accidents or decision patterns that are influenced by external factors outside of their control, or simply being constantly tempted by the wanton bombardment of undeniable desires. Now, people take out loans because of situational happenstance. Each of the major banks in the United States brought in a billion dollars in 2020 in overdraft fees, just to let you know. It's not hard to see the parallels between the having mode and addiction, in addition to the envy of the endless shiny material possessions of others. Another major way to reset and instill patience is just take a good vacation away from the overstimulating world. And again, knowing these many explanations for why people succumb to impatience, we can carry forward in the world with more patience ourselves towards others. More patience and understanding for those who are so lacking in it. Which brings it to the fifth virtue, kindness. Kindness and patience go hand in hand. Understanding, compassion, compersion, connection, seeking to relate to each other and simply making the world better for each other. These are all qualities that we want to instill, but they take work. Exemplifying kindness is what most people want to do, 
but they struggle due to myriad factors, a predominant one being simply missing opportunities due to our fast-paced culture. How often have you found yourself saying things like, man, I really should have said such and such stuff then, or, oh man, I meant to say this, but the words came out like, <laughs> <laughs> Or, oh man, I just thought of the perfect thing to say. I really could have brightened their day with that one. Rats. We have to remember that we often cave under pressure. And even with proper practice, effort, and care, it can be hard to recall all of our practices in the moment. Our intentions and methodologies can be hard to bring up in the moment, unless we're trained impromptu comedians or something. So what does neuroscience have to say about kindness? Well, the left ventromedial prefrontal cortex is largely responsible for social interactions and political correctness and just social norms, and somewhat by extension, our sense of trends and social justice. Autism accounts for about 1% of the population, or 100 people out of 10,000 in case studies. Now this has increased from the 62 in 10,000 back in 2012, but that statistic is just from those who have been diagnosed. And I can tell you, I'm not gonna get into all the statistics, but they don't look good, <laughs> and especially in the United States. The US SSRI prescription rates have more than tripled since the 90s. The number two most depressed country in the world, and number one in the use of anti-anxiety medication, and it's been that way for a few years now. It has long been my feeling that everyone has some form of disorder or maladaptive behavior, behaviors or thought patterns that have just gone unaddressed. I think the latest statistic is one in four of the population has some form of diagnosed or undiagnosed mental disorder, whether recurring, exogenous, or endogenous. Often those on the autism spectrum, or those who struggle with social norms, tend to come off as abrasive, reactive, defensive, or contrarian, when in reality they may just be struggling to do their best. Their errant past influences, upbringing, and possible genetic mental predispositions all factor into how they react in split-second decisions during conversation. Of course, knowing how to practice slowing down and exercising patience is also something that must be taught, or figured out the hard way, and like everything, learning is nuanced. The capacity to learn from our mistakes can be better in some, and worse in others. And even with practice, some struggle more than others due to genetic predispositions. Number six, goodness. Well, this is about as blasé and unspecific as I can get, and the idea of instilling goodness in oneself and in the rest of the world is also incredibly subjective and undefinable. But a verse in the Bible gets right at the crux of the issue better than any other book. Jesus Christ, or Jesus Barpentera, said in Matthew chapter seven, verse 12, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But if it's so simple, why is this such a hard concept for us to grasp and express? Why is this mantra so hard to live by? Why do we have to keep reminding ourselves of this? There must be some neurological underpinnings at play that make it so difficult, and we talk about these in previous episodes. What we want is to instill and exemplify these qualities. When I was a fundamentalist Christian in my youth, the closest example of goodness was Jesus Christ himself. So as it seemed like so many Christian fundamentalists are so set in their ways and, and rigid in their beliefs, I mean, as Gandhi put it, I like your Christ, but not so much your Christians. It can be so difficult to live the practices that we want to embody, and take on the ideals and ideal states that we want to exemplify. Well, monotheism can easily lead to the feelings of being high and mighty, because the belief in a singular god necessarily invalidates all others, and other ways of worshipping and practicing religion. Again, by one interpretation, this is not what Jesus taught. Jesus taught inclusion and seeking to connect with others and understand them, to empathize with all people of all classes and beliefs. Let's have some quotes here. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as God forgave you. Culturally, we do seek to establish a sense of right and wrong in all situations. Good decisions and bad have been examined secularly through the process of moral philosophy for thousands of years. Being a good person is largely subjective and highly complex, but we can strive to live our best lives and represent our best selves. As we say in CBT, we're only ever one choice away from changing everything about ourselves and our lives. As I mentioned earlier, it can be difficult to make good decisions in the moment because we're primarily a reactive species. We tend to think with our emotions first, and this is where practices like CBT and rational emotive behavioral therapy can really come into play. Vipassana meditation also goes hand in hand with these practices, allowing us to assign those a label and then return to what we're focusing on in the moment. As in, this is planning, or this is thinking of a retort or simply daydreaming. We label the experience and return to focus. Mindfulness and CBT are critically linked. Uh, Dr. Shana Shapiro describes the core components of mindfulness as intention, attention, and attitude. It's the IIA method. When we enter a conversation, we want to begin with positive intention. That positive intent aids us in keeping attention, which grants us a better attitude throughout the talk. We can also focus our awareness on our intention by paying more attention to ourselves. Another example, if we're walking on the street and encounter a random piece of trash, 
If we are already carrying an attitude of open-mindedness and caring and empathy, then we'll pick it up and toss it in the trash can. Our intention to do good really focuses our attention on ways that we can help in the world. And we will also reinforce an attitude and intention to remedy the situation by, by throwing away the trash. Now, for the virtue of goodness, I have little neuroscientific evidence to offer. It is an entirely human-made conception, as are all words. One that's been mulled over in countless philosophy books for ages. In Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, in Plato's Republic, in Spinoza's Ethics, and the works of Marcus Aurelius, and more recently, those of Steven Pinker, uh, William McCaskill, Peter Singer, and Jonathan Haidt, to name a few. It's hard to just be good objectively, because what is good to one person may be unfavorable to another. To decipher what the majority deem as good, concerning the public good. And I would say we need more and better introspection to determine what is good for ourselves. To put it vaguely, being good to ourselves, treating our minds and bodies well, makes it easier for us to be good to others. Otherwise we're fighting our own neurochemistry, we're working with a rusty, badly oiled machine. 7. Faithfulness now here's where we start to kind of break from the connections between each of the spirit fruits. Faithfulness is not preceded, nor is it reinforced by goodness. The idea of faith gets complicated quickly. One could lead a life exemplary of all the fruits of the spirit, morally sound as Jesus did, and the religious person would call this living a faithful life, faithful to the qualities of the scriptures. But then one gets to the crazy parts of the Bible, like the sacrifices, or Jesus saying that people can heal people with their hands and drink snake poison if they follow him. And we wonder why the lack of those qualities isn't questioned. Is one not exemplifying faith if they don't have these powers? Or are they not being faithful enough? What if they don't believe in the miracles, but believe in the message? Uh, is faith just believing really hard? Furthermore, how are we to interpret the use of the word at all? Faith in God? In Jesus? In the entirety of the scriptures? Or are we meant to ignore certain parts, like the drinking of poison and such? And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Here, Jesus uses the word belief, or more specifically, the latest translation is closer to the word belief than hope or faith. Now what about the idea that we will live forever in paradise? Taking it that way feels closer to the word hope, if you ask me. And of course, it shouldn't be wrong to ask all these questions. God gave us a brain with the all-important capacity to question our reality, and we should exercise that. Because if we don't consistently question our ever-changing realities, our lives will be decided for us. Like I said, it gets complicated quickly, and this is why people prefer to take certain parts and leave others. But if we do that, how can we have faith that we are doing exactly as the Bible portrays, doing exactly the right things to be able to live forever in this heavenly paradise, and avoid the eternal torment and punishment of hell? Paradise versus eternal fiery damnation. <laughs> it's a horrible thing to teach people, and especially children, but I won't get into that. We also spend countless hours trying to properly interpret the scriptures. This is a process called hermeneutics, and it is insanely difficult, if not impossible, given the translation issues. Often an entire congregation of worshipers performs their specific type of worship and faithfulness based on the interpretations of just one of its members. This is why I can't really argue with Thomas Jefferson's method, where he took out all the crazy stuff like miracles and demons and angels, and hellfire and eternal life, and left the important lessons, the parables and metaphors, like this structure of the fruit of the spirit that we're discussing now. But Jefferson, of course, wasn't the first to question these miracles. In the 19th century, the philosopher Paulus examined these issues from a rationalist perspective. He said that, quote, Once a person has grasped the spiritual truth of Jesus' person and teaching, miracles become superfluous in anyway. The proof from miracles itself always demands first, as it must, that the claim should be worthy of God and not contrary to reason. If this be the case, then a miracle is no longer necessary as proof for them. I may identify as a non-indoctrinated human, but I believe it is the fool that turns their nose to the lessons to be learned from these ancient scriptures. Especially ones that are less dogmatic, threatening, and dictatorial, like Buddhism, Hinduism, and Jainism, for example. So we want to establish faith in something, don't we? This quality is there for a reason. It is fundamental to the human condition to rest our confidence in something. I use this word rest here quite intentionally. We cannot always actually be questioning things and doing multi aspectival perception every second, due to combinatorial explosion. Though we can remain open-minded in all situations. We should also remember the saying, quote, we want to remain open-minded, but not so much that our brains fall out. And we should remember that exercising open-mindedness kind of runs counter to having a solidified belief system or having a, an absolute confidence in something. It's kind of impossible to do so. And this is largely the duty of scientists, or largely the duty of science in general, is to remain unbiased and open-minded open-minded to new facts and new evidence, however that makes us feel, like we have to set our emotions aside, our solidified emotional beliefs aside, for new information. But that can be very difficult when you have the reward of eternal paradise as a counter to that. Resting our confidence in facts and reason leads us to a more flexible and adaptive life, 
one that leads us to more confidence in our reasoning, one that is fit to work better with the fluctuations of reality. As Heraclitus said 2,000 years ago, the only constant in life is change. Man does not step in the same river twice. And so to live the most realistic life and the life of most connection and genuine interaction, we have to be open-minded. We have to remain open-minded to new ideas and new belief systems. But all I'm doing here is just saying words, so if you don't agree with me, then please leave a comment in the comment section. Anyways, I would propose that ultimately we need to rest our confidence in fact. Here's a useful idiom. Faith based in fact is founded. Faith based in feeling is folly. As we explored the diagrams in the previous video, we want our faith to be based on a solid foundation for personal growth, which inherently comes from critical thinking. And yes, Jefferson and Paulus were both picking and choosing the parts of the Bible that they liked, but they did so with a constructive, well-examined method, because they were searching for a way to logically ground their religious belief system in reality. Anytime that we find ourselves submitting to an activity or idea because it sounds good, or ignoring one part of a teaching or scripture that contradicts another in order to keep cohesion in our belief system, we are making decisions based on feeling. In this instance, we're deceiving ourselves. It's atma pratarana, self-deception. In philosophy, this is a logical fallacy that's called appeal to emotion. We can make decisions based on what feels right in the moment, but this is different from the term trusting our gut, though. When we base our decisions and our default conclusions in fact, we can be most assured that we are building our life on a solid foundation. I say most assured here because we can never be completely sure of anything. Again, we cannot have 100% confidence in anything, so we want to have the most confidence that we can in something, and that comes from a fact just as the wise man built his house upon the rock instead of the sand. The foolish man reasoned with his feelings. Oh, but the sand feels good on my feet, and the house is right next to the water. The wise man chose to build his house on a rock. Although his floor was a little bit more uncomfortable, and it was a little more difficult at times, it paid off in the long run. Putting our faith in the main characters of religious documents often works, but in many instances it doesn't, because it is a singular mindset that inherently is exclusionary to other beliefs. Again, this is not to bash religion or faithfulness at all. We can applaud faithfulness from all angles. It is a exemplification of dedication to a belief, and a well-examined and embodied belief is always to be preferred and appreciated over a random sense of apathy or nihilism or a chaotic life, having no faith or beliefs or confidence in anything, and of course giving in to anything that sounds good in the moment. Because we want to be making decisions for ourselves, we don't want others to make decisions for us. The eighth fruit of the spirit is gentleness. Now my first impression on this is an implication of practicing gentleness in word and deed, but I want to start with a more literal interpretation. Neurobiology is prevalent in this virtue, so let's first take a look at proprioception, the vestibular system, and the nervous system, or our sense of touch. Our ability to smoothly move our bodies around is something that is truly taken for granted. The many feedback loops involved in the visual system and our touch system are only recently being uncovered in science. Locomotion, or just using our senses to guide our body around, is quite a feat of natural selection. For those of us that are sighted, our eyes witness the world and the objects in it, and send messages to the motor cortex to perform actions like walking or throwing a baseball. When catching a baseball, we keep our eye on the ball by using a sophisticated tracking system in the visual cortex, until it hits our palm, at which point our nervous system confirms the catch and dictates how and when we close our hands around the ball. Milliseconds later, we again use our visual cortex to target where to throw that ball, and another few milliseconds later, our vestibular system kicks in to balance our bodies as we turn around to throw the ball. All this occurs outside of our conscious awareness, yet it takes conscious effort and practice in order to hone these skills. We have these terms like hard-headed, abrasive, or rough around the edges, or boisterous. Uh, there's much variety in people's capacities in understanding how to properly wield the body that they occupy. Just look at the horse. After they're born, they're up and running around in minutes, whereas with humans it takes us around eight months just to crawl. Our brains are designed to process much more information about the world, and the first few months of a baby's life are mostly based around learning its environment. The formation of tonotopic maps in the auditory cortex, recognition of faces in the fusiform cortex, the formation of ideas about what's pleasant, smelly, nasty, or avoidable in the insular cortex. There's a lot going on in there. The formation of vocalizations and social cues is also something that takes a long time to properly hone, and some people never do. And the formation of proper cognition, how to use our brains to the best of our abilities, well, we're mostly on our own on that one. Unless we happen to be lucky enough to have a parent that's a cognitive psychologist or CBT practitioner. Look at how much we vary in our ability to express gentle touch in times of intimacy. Some people can caress and massage with great care and intimacy, with others, it's like a male chimp trying to open a coconut. Again, it's not to say that these skills cannot be honed by everyone, but there may be genetic predispositions to our motor cortex abilities. Gentleness affords peace, and peace gentleness. Now earlier I said we want to garner gentleness in word and deed. Indeed, we want to garner gentleness in all aspects of life. People and other animals don't tend to respond well to the alternatives. This is where I hold immense respect for the Jains, where they sweep brooms in front of themselves to avoid damaging all of God's creatures. 
because either great or small, God loves them all, eh? This is referring to the Jain practice of ahimsa, or strict non-violence. I would say this would be a great representation of gentleness. Literally gentleness with all forms of nature itself. And isn't this what an awakened universe would want, to be gentle with itself? Just like a baby needs to be treated gently when it's awakening to itself and its own body and mind. When we spread these messages to people, we need to be gentle with the way that we do it because it can be quite a shock to the system, just as we should be gentle in all interactions with all creatures in organic life. Though I believe the primary implication in the Bible is one of gentleness indeed, which brings me back to the golden rule, treat others as you would want to be treated. Love thy neighbor as thyself. This means that as much as one loves themselves, they should love others all the same. We are all equal in the eyes of creation. Creation can be viewed as natural selection or as God's creation. This is a paradigm that has great scientific resonance as well as spiritual, as we are all equal and connected in the process of natural selection as well. We want others to be gentle with the way that they interact with us, and so we should exemplify the same quality. But again, this takes practice, the honing of skills. Which brings me to the final fruit of the spirit, self-control. Gentleness and self-control reinforce and precede each other. This is where I would really like to bore witness to the behavioral psychology practices at play in Jesus' time. Because I don't want to just say this is vague advice. There must have been plenty of idioms and tropes going around that helped people deal with these common issues. That said, there was no formal system of examining and diagnosing problems, and I would assume that there would have been countless examples of people displaying self-control issues due to the many factors mentioned earlier, and subsequently being accused of not being faithful enough, or pious, or being a Christian, or being accused of being possessed by a demon and excommunicated from society. A prominent method for instilling self-control can be found in Cognitive Behavioral Therapy's ABCDE method. Let's take a look at this here model. Here's a bit more detailed version of the ABC model, it's the ABCDE model. Uh, this is something that's very much helped me in my own personal progress in life with CBT. So, first we have the activating event that uh, sets things in motion. And then we have the belief about that event, what we tend to tell ourselves or not tell ourselves about what just happened. Uh, when we tend to not think about things that happen, that's when things tend to get worse. So we get consequences from not examining things. So, we get the consequences. These consequences can be emotional or financial or otherwise. And so, as we've talked about before, the one thing that we have in our control, and the one thing that separates us from other animals, is our belief. What we can think about, what we can change about the way that we think about what has happened. And so, when we have the consequences, ideally what we will do is dispute our unhelpful belief system. We will review and rethink about what has happened, and from us doing that, we will have the effects of challenging this belief. We will see progress. What a great model, eh? I plan to have more lessons concerning models like this in the future based around CBT because they are so, so critical for living the best life today. I should say self-control is the one fruit of the spirit that's in need of the most up-to-date methods and examinations due to the radically different world that we now live in. Well, that's it for the fruit of the spirit. Again, I don't mean to come off as bashing any of the teachings of the scriptures here. I just want to use this time to express many of the issues that we now face in the meaning crisis. This whole problem where modern day technologies and philosophies and logic and cultural paradigms don't align well with the ideas that were written down 2000 years ago. For a more in-depth look at how we can address this issue and how to look at the increasingly abundant number of people that now identify as spiritual but not religious, I recommend checking out the conference that dropped recently from Thunder Bay, Canada. It's called the Consciousness and Conscience Conference. Uh, it's uh, involving John Verveke, uh, Jonathan Pageau, Paul Vander Clay, and Richard Monduel, uh, a priest, a Christian philosopher, an icon carver, and two cognitive neuroscientists have incredibly cordial and pragmatic discussions over a period of three days. I'll post a link in the description. It's seriously the best discussion of science meeting religion that I've ever witnessed, and probably the best conference I've witnessed in general, and I've seen a lot of conferences. Well anyways, thanks so much for watching. If you feel this video worthy, please feel free to donate to the Patreon here, um, or just share this video to get this content out there. Um, feel free to like and subscribe if you want to see more of this, and I'll see you in the next one. Again, thanks so much for watching. Secular namaste, homies. Viewers can access the Polymath Park Patreon here. Programs like this exist solely by donation, so feel free to contribute whatever you feel this video is worthy. Anything's appreciated.